Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. And today we are talking about the five fundamentals, and I have a cute little acronym for them, of getting fish to spawn. So this is from everything from the easy, easy fish like uh, guppies and plecos that kind of have a, a default setting of reproduce, all the way over to the, you know, bleeding heart tetras and panda loaches and things like that where you can spend years trying to get them to breed even when you know what is the issue and it's just getting it perfect that makes it right. But regardless of where you are in that spectrum and how you keep fish, the same variables trigger them to spawn in the wild for every species. Some of them skip some of these variables, some of them use every single one. In this video, we're doing a condensed version of the little acronym I have for the five different groups of variables that you can change and you can prepare your fish to spawn with. So in that, uh, in that theme and that hope, we're gonna look at one tank most of the video, and that's gonna be a lake inlay biotope tank. Uh, which is set up as close as possible plants-wise, uh, nine species of fish, about 12 species of plants that are all native to Lake Inlay in Myanmar. And it's one lake in particular, temperature, chemical nature, uh, the micronutrients, everything is set to that in order to try to encourage the species in there to breed. So uh, let's turn it around, hand it over to them, and let's talk about it. All right, I know somebody's gonna be that person who points out, hey, the Siamese algae eater lives outside of Lake Inlay in other parts of Myanmar and Thailand. So yes, there is one Siamese algae eater. Yes, there is one ancestress that's helping me with algae before a biotope uh, submission. Any case, back to the subject of the day. So, fundamentals to spawning fish. So you may not need all five of these uh, groups of topics and uh, subjects, but you're going to need some of them probably. And those are as follows. Your advanced planning and preparation, the flow, barometric pressure, and, and, uh, and other things like water movement, dissolved oxygen, that all goes under the acronym of flow, uh, or F rather. Uh, and <clears throat> this acronym put together spells out fact. So we've got flows, advanced planning, chemicals and chemical triggers, stress triggers, and uh, spawning triggers. Uh, there's good triggers, there's bad triggers, uh, and it just depends on what you're looking for. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Then there's temperature, which is the next T, and then there's, of course, time, knowing how long each of these steps takes, how long to wait, how long to grow things out, how long to separate the different sexes if you're trying to spawn certain fish that need to be apart, and so forth. So, the important thing to know about doing this is there are several ways to do it. By the way, I am a master fish breeder. I've bred around 250 species and around uh, 300 different types of fish if you count, you know, a guppy and an endler with a different color variant as different fish. Um, but around 250 species now I have uh, logged and also I am a master horticulturalist. Well, you may know another master breeder who's well known around YouTube, and that's Dean Tweedle. He has a lot more experience than I do. He's got some 35 years on me for experience, but uh, in, according to our club, we're both uh, we've both at least passed up to master breeder. Uh, but you can go far beyond that. You can take this hobby with you your entire life. That's part of why we love this, and that's part of why this little riddle is easy to know this little acronym of S F A C T T fact for the five different factors but you can spend a lifetime mastering the different factors well Dean he does things a sterile way so that means that he's gonna put things in a tank on its own that may not even have a substrate of any sort lots of filtration on it um, no debris on the bottom of the tank, and he's feeding it lots of food all throughout the day, um, really good quality food. Then he takes the babies away, 
and unless they're from discus or something that needs to be with the parents, takes the babies away as soon as they can be taken away, puts them into another tank or into a divided area, and then he grows them out as fast as possible. Now that's definitely the best method for spawning fish if you're trying to make money and do this as quickly as possible. But with some difficult species, or if you're just trying to do this at a more uh, natural pace or laid back pace, I suppose, uh, you can do it more this style. You still need to use some of the tricks of both styles uh, depending on the fish that you're spawning, but we're going to talk mostly about the natural style today. So the first thing you need to know about this is that there are several ways that fish actually strategically spawn and we need to know about those first. They have four main uh, ways and that is seasonally so when the weather changes when it goes from the wet season to the dry season and the puddles start getting low and the total dissolved solids increase and the temperature gets higher and the fish get more and more compact together and their dissolved uh, oxygen reduces there's no flow in the puddle the water's murky looks like it's the end well then all of a sudden a low pressure front comes in there's thunder and lightning and boom rain starts for the next month straight the water fills up the fish give birth the babies hatch and with the water flowing out they go to as far away as possible from the parents with that flow with that fresh water with all the other new life that's hatched that allows them to eat it and grow also so that's one way the other way is all the time like guppies they just will have babies whenever they can get a chance and for that you don't need to do much of anything so let's move on the next way is going to be condensed breeding which is when uh, a fish like a betta or a gourami will actually seek out a pond or a little teeny uh, puddle type area that's high in tannins that has low flow and it's usually the labyrinth fish that can take gulps from the top of the water that need this and uh, they also wait for the humidity to be at its peak during the warm season because they need that otherwise these gouramis they can't breathe air if their labyrinth organ doesn't form right same with bettas and so they have babies when it's very hard to see it's murky in the puddles they're very dark stained with botanicals and the oxygen levels are low and that's why they have evolved to breathe air so they're kind of the exact opposite of most of the fish in our hobby, which breed when the wet season starts. So then there's another type, and this is the trickiest, which is the unknown spawners or the ones that spawn uh, one time a year. And whether it's the moon or uh, who knows, the position of Venus, <laughs> whatever it may be, uh, they know the time of year, something like salmon and whatnot and they need very specific triggers and without chemical intervention like hormones they're just not going to spawn any other time of year uh, and that's the most difficult one to uh, have reproduce in captivity so let's go over my little acronym which uh, to make it cute it spells out the word fact and that is uh, in, in no particular order of importance was the acronym created so that I could spell something you guys would remember. But the main categories we're going to cover now about how to prep fish, now that you know all that background, is flow and barometric pressure, the F, the advanced planning and how to set up the tank right before you alter it with the C, which is chemicals and hormonal signals and... Uh, food and all that kind of stuff then the T the first T is temperature so also again if you're trying to replicate uh, those uh, gouramis for, from uh, spawning you might want the temperature to go up instead of down so you may need to keep the tank at around uh, say 80 degrees and then you bring it all the way up to 84 for them but for most fish you're going to want to replicate a dry season beforehand for a few weeks uh, two weeks is usually plenty for most species like corydoras angels most cichlids and uh, then you want to all of a sudden trigger the the wet season and then that brings in again the the t for temperature the second t is going to be for time and that is the time it takes for them to spawn the time it takes their babies to condition or to go from one phase where they're 
in a mouth, for instance, with mouth brooders, or they're in the nest, or they're in a pleco cave. You need to know how long they're going to take and when to move them. And regardless of if you're doing the, the master dean method where uh, you take the babies away uh, from the parents very quickly, unless it's like a discus or something where they rely on the parents completely, uh, if it's something like a mouth brooder, then you're going to try to usually grab them from the mouth pretty soon so that accidentally they don't eat any of the babies or anything. And same with like plecos, as soon as they give birth and they have babies in the cave, even though the dad still may be guarding them, you're going to go ahead and take them and move them to another tank altogether. Like here we've got an epistogramma tank and uh, that's why you need to know the time and how long it's going to take for those babies to grow up big enough that their parents won't eat them and then if you want, you can return them to their uh, colony with their parents, or you can uh, sell them or whatever you want to do. So let's go over each one of those in a little more detail as we discuss uh, how it is to replicate the dry cycle. And I'll show you a tank I'm doing that on right now. All right, so here is a tank that I am actively trying to replicate the dry season on. So we've got the filtration still going, hang off the back. And we don't want the nitrates too high because the C in this acronym fact, we don't want the chemicals ever to be harmful. You don't ever want the nitrates to be so high that it's causing problems. You don't ever want ammonia present, copper in a shrimp colony. I mean, you name it, you just be reasonable. You don't want certain things in your tank. Now, in the wild, however, they do allow the nitrites to go up to a certain level because, like I said, they end up condensed in ponds as the water level drops. During the wet season, they were spread all out all over different forests and things, and it, they were flooded into different lakes and ponds, and those ponds get smaller and smaller, or the rivers get faster and faster and lower and lower until then they get slow, and then they turn into stagnant pools. Well, the same thing you need to try to replicate in your tanks with a lot of species. And so you need to do the research. And that advanced research, the A in the acronym, advanced planning and research, you need to know what they're going to spawn on. So do you need smooth materials? Uh, do you need a cone for like angelfish or discus? Do you need a cave for plecos? Do you need a cave for uh, different cichlids. Like in here, I've got some Enigmatochromus leucansi, and I'm trying to get them to spawn. And so I've put little caves in here for them. Different shaped caves for different species. Um, and also something that a lot of people don't do, but in the more natural style of breeding, it's very important to do, uh, is you allow the algae and the microflora and fauna, the little bugs that dance on the top of the water, the the uh, snails, whatever it may be that's growing seasonally, especially if you can find research that tells you what lives in their area. If it's, uh, you know, if it's little worms, if it's mosquito larva, if it's, uh, if it's um, brine shrimp or daphnia, try to provide that to your fish. And most of all, learn to do live cultures like infusoria and other uh you know white worms and vinegar eels things you can keep sundry bottles for around the fish room and always have some concoction brewing for green water in the window uh high in tannins black water and so forth doing all that research ahead of time and knowing what the conditions are like where your fish are found will help immensely and that is the thing you need to spend the most time on honestly and the 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 step that most people skip including a lot of very seasoned fish keepers and by the way this goby is ready to burst she is full of eggs you can actually see the outline of all the eggs in her belly when the lights right and the males are showing off and the uh, pseudomagill luminatus are all colored up and ready to spawn the thread fins are colored up. See, the, the male gobies are uh, flashing and flaring and showing off. Well, if they didn't have the proper food, if they didn't have a 50% diet of protein and uh, protein films and algae, these gobies wouldn't be ready to spawn. They wouldn't be colored up. Uh, they need those C's, which is in that acronym fact, which is the chemicals. They need uh, all the anthocyanins and the carotenoids and the omega-3s, omega-6s. That's why enriched food can be helpful uh, in feeding your fish in the off-season when you're not spawning them. 
Uh, same with these Garamis that are getting ready to, to, to spawn. So they need to have the right environment set up, whether that's uh, mimicking a river or mimicking a lake. It really helps a lot. Now, a lot of species will spawn without the exact mimicking, but many won't. So I like to do it anyways because I find it uh, educational and part of the fun of keeping fish and breeding fish. And you can kind of grow them out as a community, simulate the dry season, and then when I'm ready to spawn them, because they would spawn in a community tank and the eggs and everyone would just get eaten, the babies would get eaten right away, I then split up every group that's ready into smaller tanks. And those smaller tanks will be seasoned to the change or what induces spawning. And if I were to do that to this whole tank, like take everyone out except for those cichlids, what I would be doing would be first uh, the flow, the F in the acronym. I would change the flow. I would either add a power head or I would add uh, an air stone so that the oxygen level rises. And so that it, what it does is it replicates that thunder, that big thunder cloud, that big storm that starts the first drops of rain in the wet season. And then you start getting water rushing into the puddles and all of a sudden the water level rises. Your fish have lateral lines that line down the side of them and they have all sorts of little barbels and sensors. And this stuff is all to tell them how much ozone is in the air, how much is in the oxygen or, or rather in the atmosphere that's dissolved into the water. Uh, where is it coming from? Is it is it actually changing for the season or is it just a one-off for a few hours? And the levels of these chemicals and things tell them that. Some fish need black water and you need to know this where they're going to have lots of tannins, lots of botanicals, cloudier water, uh, and usually a much lower pH. And that is where chemicals continues to be important. But the most important thing that so many people uh, skip, in my opinion, is getting the tank ready for the babies. So when you're spawning tricky or oddball fish that may not follow a, a spawning regiment that's easy steps that you can find online, you need to make sure that they are sensing, oh, there's food for my babies in this tank. I can have, I can use up the, the protein and the energy that I've been fed for two or three weeks. That's part of that time part of the acronym. And I can now spawn, I can use up that reserve of protein in those eggs and the water flow and the water level and the barometric pressure in the atmosphere and the humidity, everything plays a role. Now we can't control all those things usually, so we'll try to control some. And with chemicals, stress is a big one that can limit spawning. So you wanna keep the cortisols down and you wanna keep the pheromones and hormones up. So fish, just like humans, have chemicals they release that say, hey, I'm ready to go, I'm in the mood. Usually fish also color up and they're bright, and if you've been feeding them the foods with all those things I listed in them, they're ready to go. So here we've got another species of pencil fish that the females are ready, they're full of eggs, they think it's the peak uh, dry season because their tank is warm so the next T is going to be temperature and when we were if we want to spark them into spawning they may even be laying some eggs now but if we really want them to dump spawning you can separate the genders and for a week you keep it warm you keep the TDS a little high the tannins a little high and then what you're gonna do is put the genders together keep feeding them food and including the the little foods that they need to have present for their babies and in my opinion, the easiest way to do that is to keep a very natural tank that's, you know, a, a year or six months old at least. That's going to keep all the little food elements, all the little microbes and microorganisms and algae and whatever it may be that your baby fish are going to need. They're going to survive and thrive off of that once they hatch. And then you can either t remove the parents or you can leave the babies in the tank that you move the parents to from the big tank. But whatever you do, you're going to then spark that with the temperature change. You're going to fake out whatever it is, whether it's a season or just the water. Some fish, it's just the pH you need to change. So this is all where your research comes in. But these are all variables that are important. And the other thing is, you know, some fish mate in groups. Some mate only in pairs, and it's for life. Others uh, scatter and don't really care. You know, they just scatter their... Uh, 
their seed and then uh, the, the males come and they scatter their business over the gravel. So you need to do the research too on do you need 15 fish, do you need two fish, what, do, what are you working with? And if you're breeding small fish and nano fish, it's very important to have those those uh, microbiome set up. So all the, the algae and things that a lot of people want to manage, if you're going with this natural way of, of spawning, you want to leave a lot of that in. Uh, and if it, if it replicates their natural environment and adding um, tannins and leaves and botanical matter and all that helps, even if not having any filtration helps, then once you put the adults in and you know, for instance, it's going to take three days for the eggs to hatch. There's all sorts of different ways where you can separate the adults from the eggs. It's going to depend on the species. Some species, the parents are going to take care of the babies in their mouth or in a bubble nest. So I don't want to get into that in this video, but as soon as the babies, the other T and the final uh, of the five parts of the acronym, that time acronym, uh, it, you know, it, it means that if they spend three days as an egg, you need to know that. So on day three or four, you're watching the tank and you see, oh, I've got little teeny fish in here. And uh, then you can take out the parents because you know that the babies have hatched. Or if you just want to spot the eggs, that's the plus side with the more sterilized uh, mass breeding uh, fish room setup like uh, uh, Master Breeder Dean does is you can actually then control that because you see the eggs drop and you can pull the parents right away. There's no, uh, there's no chance of the parents eating the babies or anything like that. So I hope this list is helping you guys and that it will help in the future when you decide to breed fish. And uh, if you guys enjoyed what you saw today, this morning, this afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are, Please hit that like button, drop a comment, what are the tips and tricks you know for spawning fish that are pretty universal that work, and what other factors are, are important in spawning fish. Uh, the pump just turned on, so it's time to end the episode. Uh, you can hear the flows kicking up, sounds like the, uh, the dry season's over and the wet season's kicking on, the low TDS, lower temperature water change is happening and the fish are gonna send out all those chemical signals and say yes, uh, and start pairing off and going into their caves in that tank. So again, thank you. If you wanna support the channel, there is a little heart with a dollar sign in it. If you like this video in particular, you can do it that way. You can click the join button and become a member of the channel and have access to all sorts of other stuff. Or you can just like the video, share the video, watch the video. That's plenty enough on its own. But thank you for your time, and I hope to see you guys again. Take care, and remember, fact, with two T's, because we don't spell right around here. Talk to you guys later. Bye.